I first played The Walking Dead Definitive Edition in October of 2019 for a Halloween stream event, and then played each successive season, one per year, before creating the respective reviews for this video series. And this whole time, the whole four years since I first touched this game series, I knew that this video was going to be about one thing, the ending. When I first wrote out this introduction, like as I typed it out, I really struggled not to write it in present tense, because I know that the title is going to have something to do with how Skybound Games ended the final season of The Walking Dead and the series overall, and how bitterly disappointed I was by the choices they made. Now, this is all personal preference, obviously. I actually love this game, and it's my second favourite in the series after the first season, but I feel so strongly about this ending that I'm sure the title will feel a bit clickbaity. But don't worry, we'll talk about it. Since I know you all lie awake at night waiting for another upload from this channel, and to finally put this video series to rest, to finally say we have played and reviewed every game in the Telltale's Walking Dead series, let's finally tuck in to The Walking Dead, the final season. This review is going to be structured by the themes of the game, the past, the present, and the future, more specifically the legacy of Lee, the hope for humanity, and the afterlife. And when I finish this video, I want you all to be just as annoyed as I am. But before we begin, let's hear a word from today's sponsor. Brilliant. As many of you know, I got laid off late this year. Goodbye web design, hello mum and dad's house, home cooked meals, and 10am wake ups. And while I am in no rush to throw myself back into the world of employment just yet, I have been using my time wisely and making the most of Brilliant to brush up on my skills in the meantime, specifically my programming skills, which are about as average as they could be. Brilliant offers an incredible catalogue of online learning courses, specifically focusing on STEM subjects, maths, data science and computer science, all through fun and bite-sized interactive lessons, with new ones added every single month. Whether you're like me and you're just looking to keep the ball rolling with career-relevant learning while you look for a new job, or whether you're looking to learn a brand new skill from the ground up, Brilliant offers a customised programme to suit your learning needs to achieve at your own pace. So visit my link today over at brilliant.org forward slash to get started for free for 30 days and the first 200 of you to visit will receive 20% off an annual plan. That's brilliant.org forward slash MerkKK for 30 days free, and if you are quick enough, 20% off your annual plan. Much of the final season of Telltale's Walking Dead is all about looking back on Lee. For those of you joining us, for whatever reason, Lee was our main character at the beginning of season one. Sat in the back of a police car for the crime of killing the man his wife was cheating on him with, Lee was in the process of being transported to prison. I've been on a good few ill-fated drives in my life, like once my friends and I drove to Whitehaven, God rest our souls, that place is a shithole, but nothing comes close to Lee's excursion, especially since his police ride occurs at the beginning of the zombie outbreak, an event that lands on Lee like a Looney Tunes anvil. As he struggles to pull himself from the rubble of a crumbling society, venturing out into this newly hostile world to find help in community, he encounters Clementine, a tiny girl hiding away in her treehouse as she waits for the return of her parents. The short of it, they're not coming home. Lee takes Clementine with him to Savannah, her parents' holiday destination of choice, and should it have all gone to plan, the place they are holed up and hiding away in. Unfortunately, it's not meant to be. Clementine's parents were zombies the whole time, and Lee is bitten in his frantic attempts to save her when she is kidnapped by a man who has snapped in the wake of his own family's death, an event directly caused by the actions of Lee's found community in the first place. Yeah, there's a lot to it. Honestly, I recommend you just watch my previous videos if you're curious, or pick up the games yourselves if you've never had the chance. However, beware of spoilers coming right up. Lee dies, and our final shot sees Clementine wandering the fields outside Savannah. It's a gut puncher. I cry like a baby every time I play out this scene. I sob. I am a mess. However, despite time passing for Clementine in between the first and final seasons, it's this final series that fixates on Lee in a very human, grieving way. He's brought up fairly frequently, despite it being something like eight years since he died, and while you could argue it's fan service for him to repeatedly return, I'm not sure why you would. Lee was Clementine's protector and father figure. He died for her, and she loved him so much that we never hear a thing about her parents, only Lee. His constant reappearances throughout the series serve as vestiges of his memory. In reality, his corpse is still rotting on the floor of that shop back in Savannah, probably a skeleton by now, just cold dirt and silence, but to Clementine, he isn't real so much as he is just present, like he watches over her. It's in this season that Clem begins to open up more about Lee. She spent the last decade processing her grief for him, but he sits in the periphery of her daily life as she comes to understand 
understand him better than ever now that she's in the same position he was. Parenthood. Many of us have lost loved ones and people you lost even decades ago are people who crop up in your memory more times than you'd expect. I lost my grandma well over 10 years ago and I still think about her all the time. In the same way, I like that Clementine's mind goes back to Lee so often. It feels extremely human. I feel like he's not wandering around like some Jedi ghost able to deliver answers from beyond the grave, but he's just there because she sees things that remind her of him all the time. That's so beautifully relatable to me. Clementine stars in the final season as our main character, a phenomenon that was previously attempted in season 2 to mixed reception. Again, I cover it in my season 2 review. This has worked to varying ends across each series, but it was most successful here in the final season, since Clementine is older, in a position of responsibility, and surrounded by peers rather than adults. The setting here helps too. Almost a decade following the zombie outbreak, Clementine is very reasonably still alive, so she must be doing something right. When she encounters our wider cast, a school full of post-apocalyptic children who have fought their fights but overall remained fairly safe and sheltered within their school grounds, she is in a position where her experience and knowledge of the outside world becomes vital to them. And she's joined by the now fully walking, talking, killing machine AJ, and already our premise is ten times more interesting than seasons two and three combined. See, Clementine and AJ share a bond that's similar enough to Lee and Clementine for us to see the parallels in their relationship without it being a complete rehash. Clementine takes her own life lessons with Lee and the post-zombie outbreak world and applies that knowledge to her own parenting style. This works so well, both for giving us problems to solve in the moment that feel real and compelling, but also in giving Clementine an opportunity to show us how much she's grown compared to the scared little girl in the treehouse and how she's applying what she's learned from her past. Not only are we presented with difficult moral choices to make, but the final season takes those difficult moral choices and then sits you in front of a six-year-old boy to force you to explain why you acted the way you did. It's a provoking setup for examining one's own morality and decisions, for sure. AJ is a great character on his own, but he's especially useful here because, similar to Clementine's own role in season one, he forces you and Clementine to be truly accountable for your actions. You can run around like the hash slinging slasher and rack up a kill count on par with pouring hot cement over a beehive, but you have to make peace with the knowledge that AJ is watching and absorbing this entire time. His actions then become a reflection on you, especially when your fumbled attempts at parenting often manifest directly in some of his more drastic behaviour. AJ is also a reflection of the characters that Clementine met on the way, his mother Rebecca and one of his two potential fathers, Alvin or Carver, who we met all the way back in season 2. All of these people died in front of Clementine, so AJ initially began as an obligation, a burden she had to take with her in the wake of their deaths. But as we saw in season 3, Clementine dearly loves AJ, taking on a role as both a sister and a mother. It becomes her choice rather than a burden. She says so explicitly in season 3, their relationship being one of the best parts of that season, but we can see it in every action she takes. Clementine was written super well in this season, but more so than the other seasons, I think, and this is mostly due to her relationship with AJ. It allows us to find justification to hear her thoughts more often. Clementine doesn't act in silence, she acts and then explains. It's very useful. But well, I mean, how does that make this game good? The final season of The Walking Dead has an advantage over all the others merely in that it's the fourth and final game in a series that had spanned six years by the time it was released. The first series came out in 2012, followed by the second in 2013, the third in 2016, and the final in 2018, which lends itself to a real feeling of growing alongside the characters here. My brother was 11 when the first season released and 17 when the final season released, aging almost in parallel to Clementine like estranged siblings. Things like this really affect people, helping them build feelings of familiarity that blossom into a bond of sorts with characters on screen. And this extends to even now if you play all the seasons together. We get to be a part of Clementine's growth and development, and sometimes she gets to play a part in our growth too. This worked in the final season's favour, since I would consider it pretty impossible to spend six years with Clementine, watching her grow from an adorable little girl into a capable and compassionate teenager, and not give some modicum of a shit about her. The same goes for AJ, the on-screen birth of which featured in season two. Although his age jumps feel way more significant than Clementine, because he goes from toddler to child between seasons 3 and 4 and almost feels like an entirely different person as a result, but there's still a sense of familiarity. This means that the final season doesn't need to spend any time whatsoever making us like our main cast. That legwork has already been done thoroughly for Clementine and sufficiently for AJ to the point where characterization can focus primarily on AJ and secondarily on the peripheral cast. And as discussed, Clementine's connection
patiently only fuels the motivation to get another proper go at being there for AJ, this season's vulnerable character. The wider cast of the final season are significantly better characterised than any such similar characters from previous seasons. They just have more space to bloom. As a result, you love them a lot more. They are the now, the thing worth fighting for. So we have our emotional backbone, but that's not going to be the sole reason why media is good, especially zombie apocalypse media. We are expecting zombies and apocalypse. The memory of Lee might carry me for 30 tearful hours, but it's not going to carry this game in a general sense. No, despite Lee's importance, it's not his story, it's Clem's. It always has been, really. And her story still needed a bite, something to motivate the player to make them care. A puzzle that a player has to solve as best they can. Wow, making your players care? That is so novel. The final chapter of Clementine's story focuses on two things. Setting up something to fight for, a real stable place full of like-minded peers for AJ and Clementine to finally relax into, and then irreversibly changing it through fire and brimstone and strife and misery, forcing them to sacrifice everything to save it before they've ever even been accepted there. While we get to feel cool and fight zombies and witness lengths of unimaginable horror unfold before our very eyes, Clementine and AJ get to bitterly grieve a childhood experience they can't themselves even imagine. A skill issue by all accounts, but this is especially relevant for AJ who was born after the apocalypse began, meaning unlike Clem, he has no sense of what childhood was like before or what it should have been for him. Unlike the other children, he isn't grieving the life he should have had because he has no sense of what that could have been. Our attention is often drawn to the fact that AJ is already handy with a gun and willing to use one. Taking the lives of potential threats is so ingrained in him that he is, in a sense, feral, at least by our standards and by the standards of the people he meets in the communities of the final season, who are less accustomed to the barbarism of being out on the roads. Clementine and AJ arrive at Ericsson's, the school that will soon become their home, after an altercation at a nearby train station that results in them crashing their car. They're pulled from the wreckage by Marlon, a Will Poulter-esque mulleted man who has taken on the mantle of leader at the school and who is keen to bring Clementine into their enclosed society. And they go enthusiastically, well, as enthusiastically as you can go in these circumstances. The school marks an environment for the kids that feels like dystopian fantasy, like those young adult novels you'd read where an entire functioning clan of children operated competently and out of the way of trouble for an entire apocalypse, like Charlie Higson's work. I really love those books. This is literally the same kind of vibe, and it brings a heightened sense of safety for the audience and for the characters. For example, this is Clementine's first opportunity to engage actively in romance. Sure, in season three you can have her kiss Gabe, but I don't count that. Firstly, you don't play Clementine in season three, you play Javier, a baseball player. He is Gabe's uncle, and if you, Javier, say the correct things, Gabe gets a kiss in the end. Like Clementine is some smoochy vending machine operated by proxy. She also has no agency in season three. In the final season, you, as Clementine, have three options for romance. Lewis, Violet, or nobody, which is still technically a romance option if you ask me, which you may as well not do, but this is my video, so haha. The optional romance in this game works twofold. Firstly, it fast tracks the characterization of Lewis and Violet, two main characters who need to be efficiently characterized in the time provided for the player to even begin to care about them by the end. And secondly, it allows us to see Clementine develop again. She has an opportunity to understand herself, explore her romantic motivations, and experience mutual romantic feelings. Like, she's my little girl and she gets to go on dates. I'm so proud of her. Anyway, with this opportunity to return to normalcy, Clementine is afforded other opportunities she would otherwise never get a chance to experience. Lewis is a tall, dapper guy who cracks jokes and plays piano. After an altercation with Marlon, Lewis realises that he needs to step up and take ownership of himself and the people around him. He needs to be responsible. Overall, he is very sweet. On the other side of the coin, we have Violet, an initially very cold young woman who quickly opens up, demonstrating her fiercely loyal, affectionate, and intelligent self. I felt like Clementine and Lewis had the better chemistry the first time around, but I accidentally went with Violet. See, on the eve of a huge battle at the school, you are given two options go and tune a piano with Lewis, or check on the defences with Violet. I was like, well, let's be reasonable. We can play the piano when this is all over with. I'll check the defences. Except I didn't realise that this was basically your who do you want to smooch choice, and my Clementine ended up being with Violet. I liked Violet a ton, but felt a bit guilty about that for the rest of the game, like my Clementine had dated her out of boredom or something. Luckily, my version of Violet died, so I didn't have to help Clementine figure out how to deliver any awkward breakup speech and then have them continue to live together at the school. At first, Clementine and AJ are just happy to be off the road in a place that serves warm meals, but they're met with some hesitation by the school children. Unaccustomed as they are to new
new faces. AJ is, as it turns out, poorly socialised. He bites people, he's hostile, he won't settle unless Clementine is nearby, and this earns him the scorn of his new peers early on. But Clementine vouches for him, and they do sincerely try to fit in. This is AJ's first opportunity to have that childhood, which elevates the importance of this setting, especially in Clementine's priorities, since she is desperate to give him a taste of a life he has been so far denied, and it also eliminates the opportunity of them destroying it, salting the earth when the enemy faction the Delta come to call. When a band of fully armed adults come knocking on the doors of Ericsson, you understand the precise nature of the conundrum these Ericsson folks are facing. They could probably just blow up the school with the Delta in it, one of the students knows how to make explosives, or they could lock them in and set it on fire, or fill it full of walkers, or whatever. Yet not only is this the home of the Ericsson kids for almost a decade, but it's also been their safety blanket. A safety blanket that has removed the need for them to perfectly attune to the ravages of the outside world, being that they always have a safe place to return to at the end of the night. On its own, this probably wouldn't be a huge loss for the player, being that they've been at the school for all of five minutes, but by adding AJ into the mix, we have a motivation of our own to end this war without accruing a significant amount of property damage. Episodes 1 and 2 give Clementine and AJ the opportunity to taste a new life, and when that life is compromised, destroying it is out of the question. Arguably, every kid at Ericsson missed out on a childhood. As we learn, Ericsson was a school for troubled children. The children were sent to the school for severe misbehaviour, pushed to the fringes of society, unwanted. When the zombie outbreak began, they were left abandoned in a school by their teachers who fled back home, except for one who met an unfortunate end. Since then, they've been surviving in the school for the better part of a decade. By the time the Ericsson kids discover a group of adults who are interested in integrating them into their own band of killers, this is the Delta. They are here specifically with the intention of poaching the kids in order to turn them into child soldiers for a war we learn nothing about, but seems futile regardless. Just another token territory dispute, probably initiated by the Delta themselves. Marlin's interest in assimilating Clementine and AJ into the school isn't entirely innocent. It's revealed he's hoping to trade the pair of them for the lives of every other child at the school, after doing something similar the year before with two of his peers, twins Minnie and Sophie, who are presumed dead by the others, including their little brother Ten. Worse, they were sold to the Delta, who groomed them to be child soldiers. Minnie was made to kill Sophie to prove her allegiance, an act of betrayal that symbolises her new assimilation with the warring communities, a childhood literally stolen. Naturally, the message of every piece of zombie media is, woo, maybe the humans are the bad guys, really? And season four of Telltale's Walking Dead is no exception. But the thing about zombie media is that fans of it really don't give that much of a fuck about human bad guys. This isn't the case anymore, but zombie media was my favourite media as a teenager. Films, books, games, TV shows, and I can tell you I was a thousand percent more excited to see some actual zombies than seeing another bandit chief reveal himself to be the bad guy really. Luckily, Telltale, and I suppose Skybound by extension, completely understand that and continue to make zombies a present and relevant threat across this final season, with plenty of opportunities for zombie murdering fun. After three seasons, the zombie outbreak has been going on for nearly a decade, and the first chunk of disbelief we need to suspend is, how are there so many zombies left? Since I feel like a sustained presence of like 10 to 1 zombies to humans would be pretty unachievable as the numbers on both sides of that ratio dipped. Once you're over that line of questioning, you're good. There's just some things in media that I feel like we need to accept, and zombies are here to stay is one of them. Still, this isn't so much an outbreak now as it is just life, and life uh, finds a way, so the people of this universe have adjusted accordingly. The citizens of the zombie universe have adjusted to zombies the same way one might account for cold weather, just a few extra measures to take when they leave the house. Now, as with the other games in that series, I actually hate the combat in Telltale's Walking Dead games. I hate it. Well, that's not entirely true. I love the bow and arrow combat segments and the shooting segments. Those are super fun and I would do them all day. Just the final season introduces several combat segments where you're in a small area and you need to either kite zombies around and wait for the time limit to run out or kill them. Firstly, while these segments happen in woods and open areas, you are given roughly the space of a child's paddling pool to run around in. There are invisible walls everywhere with absolutely no indication of boundary. Clementine will just run face first into a transparent barrier and awkwardly smush herself around the circle, usually with zombies panting down the nape of her neck the entire time. Secondly, Clementine's running controls feels like trying to reverse a postal van out of a corner shop, and she operates 
operates with the same urgency I might answer a phone call from my landlady with. Clementine runs extremely slowly for somebody evading several monstrosities that will chew her throat out if given a whisper of a chance. It's somewhere between a walk and a jog, like a light trot around a deadly paddock. What's more is that you can't pan the camera while you're running. The camera is always firmly positioned directly behind Clementine, so you can't turn the camera around to look back even a bit to see where the zombies are. And Clementine has an obscenely limited field of view, so you don't have much peripheral vision either. Though the game does try to substitute this by giving you a red tinge on screen whenever Clementine is in trouble, and you can hear directional sound if you're playing on headphones, but it's not incredibly useful. I never was able to understand how close to death I was, only that there was generally something behind me. Obviously, these segments take practice and a sprinkle of skill, which is valid, but taking 30 minutes out of a scripted four-option conversation to go and kick zombie kneecaps while another zombie appears behind you to lock you into a unavoidable, unskippable cutscene where they rip your throat out is a special class in patience. There's no denying that zombies have ironically lost a bit of their bite in this season. While we do have many opportunities to sneak around, fend off, and kill zombies in the final season, they are no longer scary so much as they are just annoying. And that's valid, I think it would be impossible to drag out the actual horror of a zombie like this 40 hours on without some very specific tweaks to the story. They are too mindless to be consistently frightening. And surprisingly, instead of merely settling for this, Telltale began to build on the concept in a small way. While I don't think they pulled this off in a way I found to be especially compelling, I had to give them the benefit of the doubt for trying something new after 30 hours of zombie killing normality. They introduced James. Now, James is a Whisperer, a group you'll be familiar with if you've watched the show or read the comics. The Whisperers are a pretty cool faction in The Walking Dead. They're a group of people who have figured out that zombies can be fooled. If you skin a zombie and turn that into a cool little costume, it means you can walk undetected amongst their hordes. As long as you're not obviously alive, hence their name, the Whisperers, you have to be very quiet. James is a solo Whisperer, having left their clan a while ago to wander the world alongside his hordes of zombie friends. He joins the cast around the time the idea begins to be floated that the person inside a zombie is still alive, just dragged along for the ride. Some characters consider this to be a fate worse than death, literal human hell, forced to watch your body rip loved ones and strangers alike apart. However, James thinks that this would be peaceful? I don't know. The crux of James's presence in the game is that he arrives to throw a spanner in the works with Clementine's perception of zombies. He broaches the idea that zombies still have the original people inside them, and therefore we should try to treat them how we would want to be treated. While this does contribute to an overarching discussion of what awaits us after death, hint hint, the issue with this fairly late term suggestion is that it doesn't really matter to us or to Clem. Zombies have been around a while and they are cold-blooded gruesome murderers. You're telling me that the human soul might still be trapped inside it, like a helpless human host trapped in a murderous automaton forced to watch themselves eat their children? Okay. Yeah, he might be right. At this stage, how much does it matter? Clementine has had to kill or be killed for the better part of eight years. We are well aware that zombies attack on sight, they can't be tamed, and trying to contain them is only going to backfire. So what, we let them roam, and if we make any sound they tear us to shreds? The person might be in there, sure, but I can't imagine a line of logic where that's actually going to matter to us at all. Consequently, James's strange preaching comes off as really ignorant. Living amongst zombies, he is going to know better than anyone what they're capable of. They might go dormant and quiet in the barns that he locks them away in, they might stare at wind chimes, but they'd still eat a baby if they found it crying. See how you feel about them when you take your mask off, James? I don't care if the soul is intact, I'm still going to set them on fire. It's a futile hill for James to die on, and hardly one you'll have much compassion for if you've played all the preceding games. His weird, controlling attitude towards the way you engage in self-defence makes it difficult to reason with him if you argue with him. He insists on you following his strategies, stunning them instead of killing them, and gets very demanding about how you conduct yourself. It's actually really irritating. If you hear what he has to say and disagree regardless, he will get so upset that he abandons you in the final episode of the season, implying that you've become a monster. Like, he will literally just fuck off and leave you out of anger, but personally I don't care. We have bigger issues than some random hippie crank. Most specifically of those problems, we have the Delta. The Delta are just another run-of-the-mill post-apocalyptic faction. Or they would be, if not for one thing. Lily. If you recall, which if you're watching this I'm sure you do, Lily was one of the main cast in season one of Telltale's The Walking Dead, and a blast from the past for Clementine in particular, who had the pleasure of seeing her consistently at her very worst. Lily is a complex character who is honestly best understood by playing the game. In some moments, I really liked her. She would have been an asset and a friend in another life under different
different circumstances. Lily was extremely loyal, honourable and detail oriented. She went without food so that others could eat, and made decisions that others couldn't bring themselves to make. Unfortunately however, her unwavering loyalty was to her father and all the poison he brought with him, with his lone wolf hostility rubbing off on her so horribly that she crumbled under paranoia, self superiority and rage. This resulted in her murdering your friend, either Doug or Carly, shortly before leaving the group either of her own volition or by Lee's hand. In a stunning twist that honestly blindsided me on my first playthrough, Lily returns, and she recognises Clementine. This is a really fantastic relationship for them to have because, I mean, her feelings about Lee will generally vary depending on how you treated her in season 1, but Clementine was like 8 years old, and Lily is fair if not harsh, so she is fairly happy to see Clementine and has no existing moral judgements about her, but they still have a history. This made her such an excellent final villain. Like, it's a blast from the past, this surge of familiarity, this knowledge of who she was at the beginning of the apocalypse, and if you're me, this dash of hope that she might come around. Yet when we see her true nature, a woman who indoctrinates and programs child soldiers, killing whoever she needs to kill to see that result, it's of no surprise. There's a bitter hatred towards Lily, especially by the end of the season, that is completely earned and feels 100% personal. I would glass this woman. I'm so glad they used her as well. Some bog standard evil dude like Carver might have their own own presence, but ultimately I think they'd fall short, especially in a basic band of bandits. Lily's dialogue and role is actually very generic within itself too. Replace her with some random and you have the most run of the mill zombie apocalypse bandit leader role in the world. It's the person that makes this so hateful, like you're ten years down the line of watching the same person make the same mistakes, refusing to ever learn or grow or examine themselves, and now it's too late to bring her back from the brink she flew by years prior. This assists in concealing the lack of actual development that the Delta gets. We meet a few members, mostly unnamed henchmen and Minnie, a character previously believed to be dead, but beyond knowing that they keep and train child soldiers and live on a very sick riverboat, there's so little to this faction and the game has neither the time or space to explore them. Especially considering Telltale went bankrupt after the second episode, I imagine this production saw so much disruption. There's a lot to explore about the morality of child soldiers in a zombie apocalypse and while we do begin to see that with Minnie and her brainwashing, the Delta are very forgettable. As I understand, there were initially discussions to include Krista, a woman who briefly took care of Clementine between the end of Season 1 and the beginning of Season 2, at which point they were traumatically separated. I think this would have been really interesting too, considering Krista left the season resentful of Clementine, bitter about her partner and child's deaths, starving and desperate, but she seemed a good woman at heart. I would have liked to have seen how she would have made a return if she had, whether she would have remained a fundamentally responsible and moral person, or whether she would have fallen herself. But there's also a part of me that likes that she just vanishes in season 2. Running into her again in season 4 would have been too perfect, too small world. The idea that you can be with somebody one day, briefly separated in an altercation, and then never ever see them again, gives me a kind of lonely dread that would be erased by Clementine running into Krista on the final leg of her journey. I needed that sudden exit, I think. It kept things bleak. Beyond that we have Abel, Lily's right hand man and the secondary antagonist of this season. Abel is the only other Delta member that sees even slightly the same level of effort to characterise as Lily, and for a character who appears here once, he is surprisingly well fleshed out for a man who has four hours to make us hate him. And yes, four hours. Abel cannot die for the first half of the game, obviously, or there would be far less of a story, but he still dies surprisingly early when we contrast him against other antagonists of the previous series who magically seem to have plot armour throughout their extended time on screen. Abel is a scary figure. Not not necessarily in terms of his actual horror either, like he himself isn't frightening so much as he just looks like a very tired petrol station employee. Physically he is not imposing, he's not especially proficient at combat or clever or charming, rather his horror manifests in what he represents to our main cast. Abel represents the fact that the Ericsson school kids are no longer skating by in the background of this apocalypse. Upon meeting Marlin, it's made very clear that they rarely ever deal with other human beings. The school is tucked far out of sight, there's so little nearby of actual use, they're not on any main roads, and consequently they have survived despite the odds tucked away in their corner of paradise. Abel also represents the cold unflinching facts. These school children have been noticed, and they've been noticed by a group of people who are never ever going to leave them alone, not until they're all dead or enslaved. But there is also the psychopathic entitlement that Abel represents. There are children here, therefore we will take them and we will use them as child soldiers. Their feelings on the topic don't matter, this is our choice to make it's a lack of respect
respect for their wishes, seeing these children as numbers to be used in their war. Abel knows where the children are. They can't possibly leave the school and go on the run, and so he circles them like a vulture. Every time you see Abel, or signs of him, you're like, oh no, oh fuck. Especially in your second playthrough, since you are consistently, sickly aware of the shit that Abel represents. The school is so fun and idyllic, capturing the vibe of young adult dystopian literature, where it's a bunch of very capable kids against the world in a way that manages to maintain a light-hearted tone, or enough of one that the dark moments hit three times as hard. Like, I would happily just play a game where Clem is maintaining the school and growing in it, and like, it hurts to see Abel because you know that this means that things are about to get completely ruined. He represents a disruption of the status quo in a way that will only ever be negative for the children of the school. And Abel is no stranger to these children either, or rather, one of them. As we learn across the first third of the story, Marlin is already well acquainted with the Delta, having unfortunately encountered them a year prior. Faced with a choice to make, Sophie and Minnie or everyone, Marlin gave the Delta Sophie and Minnie, hoping it would be enough to allow the school kids to live in relative peace, and obviously it wasn't. Having taken the two, the Delta are in a position of power and strength, and so they return a year later to take all of the children of the school, and Marlin's first lie comes to light. Now, Marlin isn't necessarily an antagonist here so much as he is just a kid who had to make some very difficult choices by himself, but it demonstrates a fantastic portrayal that works really well. He is the leader of the kids living at the school, operating out of the principal's office. Marlin assigns work and territory, sets rules, and handles all day-to-day -day business. He has stepped up and all the kids really look up to him. He is fair and kind and even-handed in his judgments, or so we assume until we learn that he trafficked some of his own community, then pretended they died, and then just felt bad about it. Obviously, we don't know the full story, like whether he had an opportunity to tell somebody else, get help, or whether it was literally a gun to the head, now or never choice that he had to make on the spot, but he didn't tell anybody that we know of, and by the time he's challenged by Brody, his counterpart and co-leader, he's in too deep with the lies, and he accidentally kills her while trying to keep her quiet. The lies escalate alongside his hysteria, he gets super upset, and has to be talked down in the courtyard in the pouring rain, at which point AJ pops him in the back of the head, killing him instantly. In the moment, you really despise Marlin, like you feel really angry, but writing this all out, I kind of realised that he was well-intentioned, in a difficult place, couldn't handle the pressure and guilt of a decision he believed he'd made for the good of his people. This moment also shines an obscene amount of judgement on AJ's actions and your teachings by proxy, and begins a long line of questioning. Will AJ be a good or bad person? What is his fate? How much power do you have to guide him? Even in life or death situations, there is a huge focus on picking the answer that teaches AJ morality. Morality by post-apocalyptic standards, obviously. Will he be the final villain of Clementine's story? When Clementine is knocked unconscious, something that happens a few times this season and in the previous seasons, and sometimes when she's just dreaming, she finds herself on a train with Lee. In these moments, she is her nine-year-old self, leaning her head on Lee's arm as they ride a train to nowhere, trundling through a beautiful rich forest while they talk and rest. The game keeps things ambiguous as to whether this is Lee actually in the afterlife, Clem's own thoughts projected through her imagination onto Lee, or a dream that Clementine is having about visiting the afterlife. The cynical part of me says dream, but the hopeful, idealistic part of me says afterlife. Either way, these dreams serve to demonstrate a feeling of continuity, that the veil between life and death is its thinnest in this zombie outbreak dystopia, and that your loved ones are a mere shut eye away, which they probably are, they definitely are. In these moments, Lee talks about seeing Clementine again one day, and also makes observations on how well she is doing, both for herself and in raising AJ. These scenes are really beautiful, they're my favourite scenes in the entire series, just for how pure and hopeful they are. Like, it erases the fear of death when you know that Clementine will just wake up on that train with her head on Lee's shoulder, watching the world quietly go by. Moreover, what waits for us after death is a huge theme in the final season of The Walking Dead, when we meet Tennessee, a young boy, the brother of Sophie and Minnie, who believes his sisters died the year previously, we are introduced to the concept of faith. This isn't necessarily religious faith, I don't imagine an afterlife is necessarily a religious phenomenon, but rather he wonders about where his sisters might be now, what they might be doing, and whether he will see them again one day. We see this in the drawings he does, drawings he will gladly add Clementine and AJ to if they ask nicely, drawings you can display on the walls of your little bedroom. When we meet James of the Whisperers, we learn that while he is a bit of a quack, he wonders whether human souls are still inside the zombies. I would disagree pretty hard, and we have this theme again, what happens to the soul? What happens to the person? Are they trapped along for the ride? Is it hell, while Clem's train is heaven? Or like James imagines, is it peaceful? It's probably not very peaceful. When we have options to kill a long zombified couple in the train station, a couple who have asked to be left alone, belted to their seats so that they can look out of the window together forever, I mean, 
I kill them, but we see again this question raised. Is the person still in there? Where have they gone? Is there anywhere for them to go? Or are they just meat now? When we tie up Abel and interrogate him, it's understood very early in the scene that he sustained significant damage in the fight preceding this scene. He's been bitten by Rosie, beaten up by Clem, and has broken his leg. He coughs up blood, commenting that something popped inside him when he fell from the window. The conversation arises again there too. Is he going to turn into a zombie? Will you let him? Unlike James, who imagines that is a peaceful way to go, Abel is terrified. The themes are laid out for us, and you know where this is going. So here we are, at the end, and when I tell you that the ending of this game soured the entirety of it for me, I want you to believe it, because I think, very firmly, that an ending was originally planned for this season in which Clementine was going to die, and I think that decision was changed at the very, very last moment, and I kind of hate it. As the game reaches its peak, Clementine is bitten on the leg. Now again, if you're somehow unfamiliar with the rules of zombie literature, which tend to be fairly consistent across the board, a bite means you will change into a zombie. If you die by any means and your brain is not destroyed in the process, you become a zombie. Now, The Walking Dead TV show takes a fair amount of liberty with this, most specifically in how long it takes for characters to turn after they die from a bite. Some characters, such as Amy Harrison from season one of the TV show, will be bitten and die only to lie peacefully for hours before they change into a zombie. Other characters die and rise up again within minutes. It really does depend on the needs of the scene, like whether we need the urgent, immediate danger of a zombie or not, but it's the kind of thing you have to suspend your disbelief for if you even remotely want to engage with this kind of media on any meaningful level. We also learn that, should you amputate the bitten limb in time, it prevents the infection from spreading and you will be spared your zombified fate. However, this needs to be done immediately. We actually have an opportunity to see this in season one when Lee is bitten. A short while, like 20 minutes or so, so later, you have the option to cut his bitten arm off. Unfortunately, the infection has already spread and he becomes a zombie anyway, but we see this done successfully with Herschel Green in the show, whose leg is amputated immediately after a bite. He goes on to live a long and healthy life, I, I promise. But still, these are the rules that are laid out to us. Bite equals zombie, amputating the bitten limb immediately equals a chance at survival. The Walking Dead is fastidious about those at least. So when Clementine is bitten, she realises that she has limited time left and needs to act quickly. In the same way that Lee understood the immediacy of his situation, but also desperately sought to get young Clementine somewhere safe and sound before he turned, Clementine mirrors him, focusing on getting AJ to safety rather than herself. Despite the bite, she walks with AJ for a while until they reach a barn, at which point Clementine sits against the wall as Lee sat against the pharmacy wall and reassures AJ that she will be fine. Everything will be okay. Just as Lee was fully infected with a grey, pallid, sweaty face and dark circles under his eyes, so is Clementine. The infection has clearly overcome her. She is beyond the point of no return and we are watching her story come full circle. This is happening. And I was pre-crying. The VODs for this still exist over on my VOD channel and if you took a peek at those I am certain that you would see my eyes brimming with tears. I was holding on by a thread. After the breadcrumbs of the afterlife, the dreams about meeting Lee, knowing that he's waiting for her and the long, long walk Clementine has taken with her infected leg, this is it. And it was about to hit me like a bus. It was already hitting me. I was barely holding myself together. Having run out of bullets, not wanting Clementine to turn, AJ raises his axe and drops it as the screen cuts to black, putting an end to the life of his mother and sister figure, the young woman who raised him from day one, and ended up putting everything on the line just to get him out of trouble one last time. Actually, no. After the game ends and we wander into the epilogue, we find Clementine here, minus one leg, which AJ had amputated in the barn instead of killing her as we assumed. All of a sudden, I became acutely ashamed of the fact that I was sucking back a sob. I felt bitterly humiliated on stream, like someone had pulled a cute practical joke on me. I was crying in front of my audience, a brimming 20 people, because the game had spent the better part of 40 hours, leading me to the conclusion that it then whipped out from beneath me, stuck its leg out and tripped me over. I felt angry. In another circumstance, it would be great seeing Clementine overcome the odds and survive. I didn't want her to die, obviously. That's why I was crying. Knowing that I was going to say goodbye to a character I loved so much had absolutely broken me. Except it was just some stupid last minute switcheroo. Clementine had been bitten, walked for a long, long time as the infection set in, and then just lived. She was completely fine. Is this supposed to be a twist? It's a shite one if so, ignoring not only the established rules of the universe, but also the many, many hours it had spent setting up Clementine's fate. And it 
really soured me. Now, I know that production switched hands after the second episode aired and Telltale crumbled under the weight of its hubris, but like I said, that happened after episode two. These are the last 10 minutes of episode four, so I would assume that this ending had absolutely nothing to do with the handover. I could be wrong, and I often am, but this just seemed like an extremely last minute decision. Like they got too sad writing the ending and then just quickly shat out a different one, or maybe intended to have a good ending and a bad ending, but scrapped the bad ending because it was too emotionally devastating and impactful and memorable and heart-achingly referential and full circle and brilliantly bittersweet. As we played, I knew where the game was going. Clementine was going to close her eyes, the screen would fade to black, and we would see her back on that train with Lee. He was going to tell her that she had done an amazing job, that he was so proud of her, and that she was safe now, she could rest. She was going to lay her head on his shoulder and close her eyes, and for the first time in the series she was going to be at absolute, perfect, flawless peace, never needing to cast an eye over her shoulder again. As the game veered to this solemn halt, we would see AJ back at the school with his surviving friends. He would go to the graveyard that he and Clementine had visited prior, where she had introduced him to the concept of funerals and paying respects, another foreshadowing that came to nothing, and he would take her battered old baseball bat and place it on her own grave, surrounded by his new friends as the screen faded to black and the credits rolled, and I was already crying. Instead, we get this, a narrative cop-out that left me visibly annoyed four years later. And when you're set up so hard with this expectation that you basically know Clementine is about to die and you are mentally preparing yourself for this to happen and then it doesn't, yeah, it was disappointing. Cowards. That was a complete tonal shift. So thanks for watching my video on Telltale's The Walking Dead. We've finally done it. It took me four years to review every single one of these games. It's been an annual thing. I hope that this is the ending that you were hoping it was going to be, ironically, because that game series did not have the ending that I knew it needed to have. Anyway, thank you very much for Brilliant for sponsoring today's video, and thank you so much to my patrons for their support. Specifically Alice Teeters, Brian Bullock, Bile Hamaho Futh, Brody Cullen, Carl DeRocha, Christopher Chavez, Fosh, Heidi, HM, Carissa Fulcher, and Sam Jones for being my highest tier patrons. Thanks very much for watching everybody, I'll see you in the next one.